begins with Paul saying, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. According to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. But hath in these due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And this morning's message, I'm going to take it out of Paul's greetings to Titus. Grace, mercy, and peace unto you. I read that this week, and it so moved my heart. God bringing my attention to just a simple greeting of an epistle by Paul to his son in the faith, Titus. Notice that Paul here, before we pray this morning, didn't say, Titus, good to see you again, man. How things going? He didn't say that. Paul didn't even look, go to Titus in this epistle and say, well, hope all is going good and I uh, got a few things to talk to you about. And, you know, no. Paul, in his greetings, was not just making a statement. He was declaring something. I think there needs to be more Christians in the body of Christ today that speak of the oracles of God. That when you and I speak and people hear our speech, it's seasoned with salt according to Scripture, but that we're pronouncing blessing, grace, peace, and mercy be unto you. Hallelujah. Amen. And let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, again is we are so thankful to be in your house, and I thank you for this people that love you, that come to hear your word. Many come from a distance, Lord. And God, let them never leave empty. Let them never leave disappointed. But let us all be filled with your word, your spirit, your presence today. Lord, enable the Sunday school, the children's church, and bless them. Give them their portion this morning. Be with the children. And be with us here in the sanctuary that we may know your presence, your word, and know your heart today. And this morning, everybody said amen and amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Prior to our salvation, you and I had to understand that according to the scriptures, you and I were enemies of God. This is something the world that is lost, that don't know the Lord, don't understand fully. It's been said this way, the sinner does not realize how lost they are. But neither does the saint realize how saved we are. What a contrast between the two, the redeemed and the unredeemed. And that world out there, you and I, prior to our salvation, the scripture says we were enemies of God. The scripture says here, let me read a few to you out of Colossians chapter 1. Paul would tell the Colossian church and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. We were alienated. We were referred to as enemies of God. You know, you ask the common sinner today, the common non-churchgoer, if you want to call it that, even many that sit in the church today are not redeemed and are not born again. They have a philosophy of Christianity and they live by that philosophy. And even in that, they will have a mildly blessed life, but it'll never be what it ought to be. And then I would question whether those people would make it out of this life alive. Will they stand before God saved and redeemed or Will they be lost because they've embraced the philosophy of Christianity, not the substance of Christianity? The substance this morning is the relationship with Jesus Christ. To you, the scripture says, he is precious. Amen. But Paul said here that many would be alienated, enemies to the Lord. 
and the enemies in your mind by wicked works. This is what we were apart from our salvation. And I'm laying this little foundation that we can look at a contrast. So hang tight as I lay this foundation this morning. Also, Paul said that we were dead in trespasses. In Ephesians 2, chapter 1, or chapter 2, verse 1, it says, In you hath he quickened, or made alive, who were dead in trespasses and in sin. I remember those days apart from the Lord. I remember those days as a transgressor, as a sinner. Of course, back then, I had my philosophy of Christianity, and if you would have asked me, Pastor or Jeff, were you heaven-bound in your teen years? I would have said, oh, yeah, I'm a Lutheran. I was baptized as a baby. I believe I had all the answers that I thought were right. But I was an enemy of God because I was opposed to God. The enmity was still between God and myself. And what's the enmity all about? God has enmity with the human race. But God so loved this human race that he gave his only begotten son. God had a controversy with the offspring of Adam, which is you and I, of course. And God dealt with that enmity by sending His Son to the cross, God becoming man, hanging on the cross to pay the outstanding sin debt of man. So God loved this world, and that means He loves you too. Amen. God loved you so much that He came and He gave Jesus Christ that you and I can have our sin debt paid in full. Amen. This is one thing that, you know, we don't hear preaching like this anymore, where men are taught and told, according to Scripture, that they are enemies of God. There's an enmity enmity between God and them unless they get that right and accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. God does not save man based on the merit of how good he's trying to live his life. And all the good deeds he thinks he may be doing in the eyes of God. God cannot accept good works. In place of salvation. In other words, I cannot earn or behave my way into heaven. And the human race struggles with that because when you ask them, most of them think I do good things. I'm not as bad as the next guy. I try hard. I try to live a moral life. But see, that's not salvation. The Bible is very clear that that is works. And God cannot accept our basket of fruit. Amen. As payment for our sin debt. And so Paul here And these are really the writings of Paul. Paul is saying that we were enemies of God. We were alienated and enemies in our mind. We were dead in trespasses and in sins. Paul even said in the Ephesian letter that we were children of disobedience at one time. In verse 3 here, I'm sorry, verse 2, it says, we walk, When we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and of the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You and I at one time, we walked according to the course of this world. The spirit that is in this world, that spirit of Antichrist, You and I, that was us. We walked in that. We lived in that. That was our motive. That was our motif, if you want to say it. That was our modus operandi. Hallelujah. That's how we functioned. Enemies, alienated, separated from God, enemies of God. There was an enmity enmity between God and ourself. Praise the Lord. Children of disobedience. It's not talking about your kids. They may be, amen. (laughs) But that was referring to you and to me. There was a time I was dead in trespasses. There was a time I was alienated from God and I was an enemy of God. I was a child of disobedience according to Scripture. And Paul would even go on a little farther in verse 3 of Ephesians 2 and he said that we were children of wrath fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You see, tell that to the common churchgoer, to the common sinner today, and that's fighting words. Children of wrath. And really, what does that mean, children of wrath? Do you realize that every individual born into the human race has, is born into the human race with the wrath of God upon that life? That sounds rash, Pastor, but that's the truth. Realize it this morning. That child you love more than life, that grandbaby, unless that grandchild, that baby, that child of yours grows up and receives Jesus Christ, unless they repent and ask Jesus into their heart, should something happen, they would die lost if they die before the age of accountability. God doesn't condemn the innocent. 
God doesn't condemn those that can't understand the gospel. There's a special mercy provided for them. But understand that this morning, every human being, whether it's my child, my son, my daughter, my grandbaby, it doesn't matter who it is, the wrath of God is on that life until that person comes to a surrender, a willing surrender for the personal condition of personal sin and receives Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Paul. You see, Paul didn't hold back. Paul said, grace, mercy, and peace unto you. But he also talked about your life prior to coming to Jesus Christ. And he does that to show us the contrast. You that were sometime alienated. You and I that were dead in trespasses and in sins. You and I that were children of disobedience. You and I that were children of wrath. One thing we did not have in that condition. We did not have the grace of God. We did not have the mercy of God. And we for sure did not have the peace of God. Amen. What brought you to repentance? What brought you to Jesus Christ? What got your attention? What did God use in your life to show you things were not right? Amen. And that's what we're looking at here for a moment. There's no grace. There's no mercy. There's no peace. Isaiah would say it this way. There's no peace to the wicked, saith the Lord. Wicked. A wicked heart. A wicked life. You know... That word wick is an old English term. It's an idiom. It means a candle wick. It means something that's twisted or bent. So when God speaks of the wicked in Scripture, he's talking the twisted, the bent, the crooked, the corrupt. Amen. That's what he's talking about. And that's what you and I were apart from Jesus Christ, apart from our salvation. Amen. You and I, children of wrath, children of disobedience, dead in trespasses. And you and I were open to the wrath of God. Ephesians 5, 6 says it this way. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And what's he talking about? Because of what things? It says in Ephesians 5, For this you know that no whoremonger, no unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. You see, Paul was really making it clear. He was really making a contrast to the unsaved and to the saved, to the unredeemed and to the redeemed. And he always had that, it was always black and it was always white. There was no gray area with Paul. You were either saved, born again, part of the church of the living God, or you were lost and needed redemption. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Boy, what a contrast from last week's message, Pastor. <laughs> we're not done yet. Just hang tight. Glory to God. We were open to the wrath of God. And then Paul would say, I believe in Ephesians 4, verse 18, he said, we were alienated from the life of God. It says here, he says, having the understanding darkened and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And so Paul, making it very clear, that men today, unless they have come to Jesus Christ, are dead, are lost, are children of wrath, children of disobedience, alienated from the life of God because and through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. That's how Paul explained the human race. Amen. Amen. But God. We flip the page. But God. But God. Who is rich in mercy. Wherewith he loved us. Amen. 
You and I are no longer children of wrath. You and I are no longer children of disobedience. You and I are no longer alienated from the life of God because of our ignorance. You and I are now bought. We are purchased. We are called. We are chosen. We are loved. We are blessed in Jesus Christ. We've been given a new heart, a new spirit. But God, where is he is rich in his mercy. He loved us. He saved us by his grace. Hallelujah. I thank God this morning I'm saved. I thank God that Christ is in me. I thank God my name is written in heaven's book of life. Hallelujah. But God, but God, I'm no longer lost. I don't belong in that first category no more. My God, I'm saved. I am saved by blood divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. And all to him freely give. Glory, glory, he's mine. He's mine, he's mine, he's mine. <laughs> I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm washed. I'm cleansed. I'm accepted by God. Nothing I did could have earned that. Nothing I could have done could have made that happen except when he knocked at my heart's door. I said yes to him. I said yes to him. I said yes to him. Some of you, he's still knocking at your heart. Don't turn him away. Don't turn him away. Receive him. Be saved. Be part of the number. Oh, when those saints go marching in. Oh, when those saints go marching in. Oh, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. When the saints go marching in, you're part of that number, my friend. Amen. You're part of that number. You and I become part of the household of God. You and I are the family of God because of Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross made it all possible. Made it all possible. Hallelujah. But God, who is rich in mercy, it was the goodness of God that led you and I to repentance. He called us with a holy calling. He redeemed us and grafted us into Christ, into the vine, the true vine, Jesus. And by the cross, he slew the enmity and he triumphed over it. And having spoiled principalities and powers, triumphing over them in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That means that your justification is a perfect justification. Your sanctification is a perfect sanctification. Do you realize this morning by your simple faith in Jesus Christ, God the Father sees you as perfect in His Son, without fault and without blame? Amen? No more children of wrath. No more children of disobedience. No more being alienated from the life of God. Christ is in us. And the life of God lives in us now because Christ by His Spirit dwells in our hearts by faith. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Why do you fight Him? Why do you fight God? Why do you hold on to your petty grudges? They keep you from the life of God and from enjoying Jesus Christ. I'm here to say this morning, my friend, He came to bless you, to save you, to anoint you, to lift you. Hallelujah. Receive Him and live forever. For to them gave He the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. I believe on Him this morning. I said I believe on Him this morning. I believe on him this morning. Amen. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. But God, who is rich in mercy. Hallelujah. With all that, Paul in his greeting this morning, if we get back to our text, he pronounces a blessing upon Titus. He says, Titus, grace be unto you. Grace be unto you. Again, he didn't say, how things going, Titus, baby? He said, Titus, grace be unto you. Now listen, grace is the extended favor of God to the undeserving who put their faith in Jesus crucified for them. 
It is the mind of God. Grace isn't just what can we say. It just sounds good. Oh, we give grace. We say grace at our meal, and that's a good thing you need to. But guess what? Grace is something. It's a power from God. It's an anointing from God. It's the help of God. It's from the Godhead to you, the believer. Moment by moment, day by day, as you live your life, as we sojourn through this life, Listen, I need God's grace every moment of every day. I can't minister without it. I can't live without it. I can't function without it. I can't work without it. I can't survive without the grace of God. Grace is a provision of the cross. It comes through Calvary. But so few believers operate today in the grace of God. Because for grace to flow in an uninterrupted flow into your life, you must maintain a proper daily faith in Christ and His shed blood for you. Amen. And friend, if you don't focus on that, that your faith is rooted in the crucified, that your faith is rooted in the finished work, that if you're not looking to the blood spilled on that tree for you personally, On a daily basis, God legally cannot bring to you the grace that you so desperately need moment by moment. You'll hinder and you'll break the flow of His Spirit. We need grace. And so when Paul was telling Titus, grace to you, grace to you, grace to you, Titus. He was saying God's blessing, God's favor, His mercy, His strength, His anointing, His power be with you, my son, Titus. Amen. Understand this this morning. This may be just a simple greeting, but the Holy Spirit, when I read it this week, it quickened into my heart. There's something to this. We need grace. We need the goodness of God. We need His help. We need His touch. We need His hand on our life on a moment-by-moment basis. Grace to you. Grace to you. Grace to you. I believe with all my heart, if we start lining up with the truth, And embrace the truth. Buy it and sell it not according to the scripture. Some of us will start seeing God's grace flowing more unhindered in our life on a daily basis. And it will change you. It will change your circumstances. It will change things that are going on around you. There will be things that will work out for the good instead of for evil. There will be more. How can I say? You will move forward much farther than you will have setbacks. And there will be setbacks along the way, even in the cross. But it's those setbacks where God is only setting you up for something better. Amen. Because grace abounding makes all things work together for good. It all works out. You need grace. You need the grace of God. You need grace this morning. Grace be unto you. Grace. His strength, His power, His might. I need grace. I need grace. I need the grace of God. Hallelujah. Grace, Titus. And then he said, mercy. I need mercy. Mercy. Mercy is the extended compassion and pity upon you, your heart, through the Godhead. It is the love of God that lifts you, comes under you, and picks you up. It's called mercy. We don't deserve mercy. But it's a benefit. And Paul told Titus, Titus, grace to you, but mercy, mercy. Mercy. We need the mercy of God. And in the mercy of God comes the compassion and the forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness of our errors, of our shortcomings. At moments, our waywardness and even our apathies. God in Christ showed mercy on the human race who was 
bound to be lost forever, burn in a devil's hell forever and forever, but God had mercy on his creation and would show that mercy through the payment of the sin death through Jesus Christ, that shed blood. One would die for the sins of all that he could extend mercy to you. Mercy. You say, well, do I really need mercy? Mess up really bad one time. You're going to need mercy. Amen. Sin and now the consequences come. You're going to need mercy. We need mercy, friend. We need mercy. We need mercy. Grace. Mercy. And then he said, peace. Remember in the beginning, we talked about children of wrath, children of disobedience, being alienated from the life of God, being enemies of God in our mind. Do you realize there was an enmity there? God had a grudge against you and I personally. That enmity, yes, it's upon the human race, but it has everything to do with you, the person, and me, the person. This is personal for God. The enmity is a personal thing. God loved you, but there was no peace between you and God, between me and the Lord, because of my sin and my condition. See, one thing the human race don't like to acknowledge, we're born into original sin, and thus that qualifies us needing a Savior, needing a Redeemer, somebody who can cure the enmity and cure the issue, but yet love me. God loved his enemies. And you and I, while we were yet enemies, Christ died for the ungodly. God's love... As the old song goes, he, he looked beyond my faults and he saw my need. Amen. He looked beyond my faults, but he saw my need. And my need was redemption. My need was to be cured from the sin issue. And I found that in Jesus Christ. I found that in the Son of God who loved me and died for me and gave himself for me. But we need peace. And when Christ hung on that cross, he slew the enmity. That whosoever will now would receive Christ can now have peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Hallelujah. I'm no longer classified as a rebel. I'm no longer classified as a transgressor. I'm no longer classified by the mind of God as a sinner. I am an adopted son of God. You're adopted children and daughters of God. He, hallelujah, you belong to Him. Amen. You've been purchased and given eternal life because you've received Him. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you, Titus. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto this congregation. Peace isn't the lack of adverse circumstances that he's talking about there. That's part of it. And I'm under the persuasion today that not everybody loves peace in their heart and peace in their home. Liz and I have known people that they, they're, they're addicted to the drama. And if there is peace, they can't stand it. It drives them nuts. And so they kick the dog and make something happen and get something worked up so they got something to talk about and complain about and cry in their tear and their beer all over. <laughs> Amen. Imagine that today. You talk about suicide. You don't have to take your life to, con to commit suicide. You just got to be addicted to drama. Amen. Amen. Too much drama in the world. Too much drama in our lives. Doesn't need to be. But that real peace he's talking about is that God and the sinner can now meet together and hold hands on a blood-stained platform and have total peace where God is no longer my enemy, but he is God my Father. I belong to him and he is mine. We walk hand in hand now. We have peace between us. Is there peace, my friend, between you 
and Almighty God. Is there peace this morning in your heart? Because Paul said it this way, and let the peace of God that surpasses all understanding rule your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I'm at peace this morning. I have the peace of God, and it passes understanding. You'll find there's times you should be all worked up over things and you just are at peace. Now, there's moments we get out of that peace when we frustrate His grace. Amen. There are times we lapse into unbelief. And when we lapse into unbelief, we have moments where we're in the flesh. You say, well, what does that look like, Pastor? You tell me. That's when you walk into the house and you feel strife in the air before anybody says anything. Right? That's why when there are certain people you're trying to talk with, have fellowship with, it's like, whoa, what's the issue there? Strife. You can either have God's peace or you can have strife. I'd rather have His peace. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you. Hallelujah. So Paul, in his greeting, he pronounces a blessing on Titus. He says, grace to you, mercy to you, and peace be to you, Titus. In pronouncing the blessing on Titus, he was really pronouncing God's blessing and prosperity on Titus's life. I'm going to say this carefully. We as parents that have children and grandchildren, it is imperative that you and I begin to speak blessing into their life. With your words, you can be either justified. With your words, you'll be condemned. I've had people, I've had a certain person one time tell me, I'd rather have my mother beat me than cut me with her words. If that mother would have spoke grace to you, mercy to you, God's peace be upon you, the difference it could have made in the outcome of those adult lives of those children as they grew up. It's imperative. Yes, we're saved by grace. Yes, it's by the goodness and mercy of God. But our part is it to bless your children when you tuck them in at night, when you're praying for their grand ones. You know, that's what I found with grandchildren now. You not only pray for your own, but you pray for those grandbabies that they come to know Jesus one day. And I pray that God's blessing on them, God's grace on them, God's mercy on them, and God's peace on them. I pray that over my children's marriages. I pray God's mercy, God's grace, God's peace be to that house. God bless them. Show mercy to them. Let your grace be evident in their lives. You see, the point, this is what I feel the Lord was really trying to bring me to this point, is that as I read this, we overlook the greetings of Paul as he would open those letters. Even Peter now would say that grace and mercy be multiplied to you. It's one thing to have it, but even multiply it. My Lord, this is important. It's important you and I that are married that we pray God's grace, His mercy, and peace in our marriage. Those of you that are going to be married someday, God's grace, His mercy, and His peace beyond that spouse to be. Or you'll live a life of hell on earth. You'll be in a prison of your own making. And friend, I'll tell you what, you don't want to spend your whole marriage asking God to deliver you. You'd rather say, God bless it. <laughs> bless it and bless it abundantly. Amen? Isn't that true? God's grace, His mercy, is peace. Listen to the words of Jesus as I close. Musicians, please. Jesus said in Luke 10, he said, into whatever house you enter, he's talking to the disciples as they go about ministering and bringing forth the word of God. He said, whatever house you go into, first say, peace be to this house. And if the son of peace be there, your peace will rest upon it. But if not, it'll turn to you again. 
What's he talking about? He's talking about as ministers of the gospel and you as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Wherever you go, pray God's peace on this home. Boy, that's something. When's the last time you did that? Pastor, when's the last time you did that? None of your business. I think we all need a tune-up here in this. You see, we want our family blessed. We want to prosper. We want God to deal with us and use us and bless us and exalt us in due time. But we need grace and we need His mercy and we need His peace. Hallelujah. Grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied to you. There's a psalm. Psalms 144. This is what grace, peace, and mercy looks like. The psalmist says here in Psalms 144, verse 12, he said that our sons may be as plants grown up in their youth, that our daughters may be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of a palace, that our garners may be full, affording all manner of store, that our sheep may bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our streets, and that our oxen may be strong to labor, that there be no breaking in nor going out, and that there be no complaining in our streets. Oh, happy is that people that is in such a case. Yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. I want His blessing. I want His goodness. I want His grace. I want His mercy. I want His peace. I want my children blessed. I want my marriage blessed. I want my health blessed. I want my finances blessed. I want my work of my hands blessed, including the work of the ministry. That our people be happy because they have found the peace of God. They have found his mercy. And they have found his grace. Grace to you today. Mercy be multiplied to you today. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior.